In our last lesson, we talked about phrase structure in Ravel's string quartet. Here I want to discuss another musical dimension, texture. For this analysis, we'll look at the slow movement of Debussy's string quartet. Texture is an aspect of the musical form. And it's also very important for the performers, especially in chamber music, since the texture determines the way the performers interact with each other. An orchestra isn't a democracy. There are simply too many people and timbres for everyone to take equal part. A tuba player doesn't normally expect to play as often as the first violins. Chamber music is much more discussion between equals. Each player gets some time in the foreground. The overall feeling for the performers is that of a conversation where all take part more or less equally. The string quartet is the summit of chamber music composition. Here we have four equal virtuoso musicians participating together in an intimate musical interaction. Although the first violin tends to have the main line more often, simply because it's on top, a well-written quartet will have the other players also emerging often and in interesting ways. Also, the players will group and regroup in the texture in fluid ways, so the quartet can have anything from one to four planes of tone at a time. This kind of thinking is an essential part of writing chamber music, especially for string quartet, since the instruments are so well blended and equal in expressive potential. Let's see how this works in the Debussy. We'll look at the opening section in detail, and then we'll listen to it once our discussion is complete. The movement starts with a short phrase in the second violin. Then the cello provides arpeggiated harmony, pizzicato, in measure two. Then the short phrase is repeated, slightly varied in the viola in measure three. This is typical string quartet thinking. It's as though the same idea is being repeated, but with a slightly different tone of voice. Why start with the second violin and not the first? Well, the first violin will have the main line a few bars later. Starting with the second violin gives more of a sense of dialogue. In measures five to six, the main idea now appears in the first violin, accompanied by a sustained D-flat in the cello and second violin. The viola, however, colors the harmony differently in the second half of the bar. When the idea is developed a bit in measure 7 and 8, the middle parts become more active, now supporting the eighth notes in violin 1 with their own eighth note movement in the second violin viola. The effect is to reinforce the rhythm momentum in the top part. Notice also how there's more activity in measure 8 than in measure 7, creating a sort of textural crescendo. Measures 9 and 10 are the same as measure 5 to 6. Then, measures 11 and 12 present the most contrapuntal texture we've heard so far. Once again, this adds intensity. In measure 13, the cello is in the foreground for the first time with the main idea. In the second half of measure 14, the first violin again takes over in imitation. Notice how in measure 15, the first violin, the second violin and the cello are all rhythmically active. Only the viola is in longer note values. Measure 16 presents a simpler texture, letting the music breathe. Over the cello's bass, the upper instruments all play in the same offbeat rhythm. Measure 17 once again has a change of texture. Here the cello is static and the middle parts add a mobile counterpoint with the viola doubling the second violin at the lower sixth. Although there are two instruments playing, the second violin and the viola form one unified plaintive tone. This is the foreground for the moment. In measures 19 and 20 this changes. Now the viola becomes static and the cello and the second violin move in parallel sixths. In measure 21, the first violin resumes with the foreground line. The viola remains static and the cello and the second violin again move in parallel sixths. Texture changes once again in the second half of measure 22, where all three upper parts are in parallel sixteenth notes, as the cello moves more slowly. In the second half of measure 23, the first violin has the main line alone. The other parts are static. Again in measure 24, the cello is in the foreground, accompanied by static held notes in the other instruments. To end this section, the first violin returns to the foreground in measure 25, as the other three instruments provide sustained harmony. Let's listen.
What's striking here is the great variety of texture within just 27 bars of music. We are very far from chorale style, where everybody has more or less the same rhythm, and the top part has the melody. Debussy's arranged things so that each player emerges at some point with the foreground line, and the secondary lines are grouped in fluid, subtly changing ways. No texture lasts longer than a bar or two. There's a real sense that the quartet is a conversation between four equals. Although this piece is not contrapuntal in the sense that a fugue is contrapuntal, the distribution of musical interest here is indeed, in a deep sense, contrapuntal. The interest never stays for long in the same part. The distinction between homophony and polyphony is not black and white. There are many degrees in between. This is at the core of what I call thinking for string quartet.